Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our biweekly legislative briefing. Um, I will turn it over to Commissioner Laura Fortman. Thank you, Jess. Hi, I'm Laura Fortman. I'm the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Labor. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon for our um, unemployment insurance briefing. I'm joined, as usual, by my colleague. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Smith. I'm the Deputy Commissioner. And um, as usual, we will go through a number of slides, um, giving you a quick update of the uh, issues that have um, happened since we've last met two weeks ago, as always, um, or as often as we can. Uh, this is streaming live on uh, Facebook. The folks on Facebook are not able to ask questions live. Only legislators uh, have that capability. But we do look at the comments and then try to uh, answer those questions in the following uh, briefing if we have not covered the things in the, uh, in the, the current briefing. Several people have sent us questions in advance, and so we will try to include those in our prepared slides. I think with that, let's pull the slide deck up and uh, start on with an update on the Lost Wage Assistance Program. <clears throat> so as all of you know, uh, the Lost Wage Assistance Program is a program that is governed by FEMA. Uh, it is not an unemployment insurance program, although it does provide benefits to people who um, are eligible for any of the unemployment programs. Uh, we wanted to let you know that as of uh, this week, almost um, 68,500 people have received a lost wage assistance benefit. There were about 650 people who weren't eligible because um, the eligibility requirements are a little bit different than regular unemployment. Um, we continue to send out questionnaires to folks um, who may be eligible, and we encourage anyone who receives a questionnaire from us or information from us asking them to go into their correspondence file to please look at that information um, and uh, answer it because we want to make sure that anyone who is eligible does receive those benefits. This program was a six week program. So, um, and it only covered the weeks August 1st through uh, September, I'm trying to remember, Kim. Uh, September 5th. September 5th. So this is not something that you can enroll in now. You had to have been receiving unemployment benefits during that time frame, And we, again, um, wanted to remind folks what those eligibility requirements were. Um, you must have been receiving unemployment benefits, either state or federal. You must have been eligible for at least $100 in weekly benefits. And you must have been unemployed or partially unemployed as a direct result of COVID-19. So we're starting to get questions from people who want to appeal um, their eligibility under this program. And um, I wanted to be clear about um, what, uh, if someone has heard it's not appealable, what, what that means is those three requirements, those eligibility requirements cannot be appealed. Those were the parameters that were set by FEMA and someone must meet them. Uh, you can um, talk to us if you think that your benefit level was set lower than $100 and there's some reason why that was um, inaccurate and that's something that could be addressed. We're also hearing from people who say that they met the eligibility criteria but they filled out the form incorrectly. If someone falls into that category, that's not um, an appeal that they're asking for. They're asking for a correction to their application. And we would encourage them to call the 800 number. And uh, we are working to provide um, uh, a mechanism so that staff can can make uh, any appropriate corrections to 
um, the application if it was filled out incorrectly. Again, I want to stress that this is not an unemployment insurance program. It is a um, FEMA program. Those benefits are not processed with the unemployment insurance um, benefits. Unemployment benefits we pretty much process on a, on a daily basis. The lost wage assistance program, those benefits are processed once a week because we have to use a, a different um, mechanism for doing that. And so it may take at, you know, at least a week in order to uh, correct something. Um, but I did want to at least put that information out there. Just next page. So um, this is a page that you're going to be very familiar with. Um, we've been updating people about, you know, what kinds of, uh, what are the claims that we're receiving um, and how do those break down? So what you see here is that about 61 uh, people are waiting for the employer verification, um, which normally takes between 10 and 14 days. About 338 people are, their claims are being reviewed for unemployment insurance eligibility. And um, when they're denied unemployment insurance eligibility, they would then have the opportunity to apply for pandemic unemployment assistance. Again, this is not new information for you. Someone must uh, first be denied regular unemployment before we can determine if they're eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance. And we have about 300 people who are waiting for fact finding and about 140 people who are in the pending status. And um, Kim, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to this. I would just add the, the pending status means that they filed their initial claim, but we have either a, a name that doesn't match the social security records that we have, or there's a, a mismatch in wages that they reported on their initial claim versus what we have in our system. So those are some issues that we have to resolve before, the, before we can make payments. Okay. And on the next slide is a, is a breakdown of the, um, the 297 folks that are waiting for a fact finding. You can see the bulk of them are from September 213. Uh, we have almost 50 that have come in since the beginning of October. Uh, and then you'll see we have one from June and three from July, 31 from August. And I just wanted to add that this is, the dates that are shown there are based on when they filed their initial claim. So an issue could have been uh, detected recently uh, that would have put that claim back in the queue for a fact finding. Uh, and that's why you might have June, um, June could go away and then it could come back again in, in a future report. Yeah, and uh, we wanted to review again, um, able and available, because we are receiving some questions about what exactly does that mean. Um, as, uh, as I hope everyone knows, in order to be eligible for unemployment insurance, you must have lost your job through no fault of your own. You must be able to work, available to work, and actively seeking work. So those are kind of the core principles of unemployment insurance. And the able and available piece means that you need to physically be able to go to work or perform the work that you're asked to do. We're starting to receive um, uh, questions from people who have been denied for unemployment because they are in the hospital um, or are recovering from uh, surgery and they don't understand uh, why they're being denied unemployment insurance. Um, unemployment insurance is not a temporary disability program, even though it's heartbreaking, people are obviously not able to work and they're looking for some sort of support. But if someone is in the hospital, um, they would um, be determined to not be able and available for work. Um, that doesn't mean it, that what that does mean is that once you are able and available to work again, that you could resume those benefits. So it should only be for that time frame um, where you're recuperating and not able to perform work that you would be denied the unemployment benefits. Next slide. So moving on to that other uh, component, which is 
lost your job through no fault of your own, able to work, available to work, and actively seeking work. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, this is about work search. As we uh, said a few weeks ago, the work search waiver has been removed and beginning this week, uh, everyone is required to participate in work search related activities. What we have done is broaden those activities. In the past, the activities were um, fairly limited, um, pretty clearly limited to looking for a job, um, uh, going to interviews, very, very focused on um, only job related uh, activities. We recognize uh, that the pandemic has created many, many challenges. Um, and to, um, to accommodate for that, we have expanded the kinds of activities that are considered um, appropriate uh, to satisfy work search um, requirements. So uh, we'll dig into that a little bit uh, deeper. One of the reasons that we do, we have resumed those work search related activities is, as you know, we're fortunate that Maine has one of the lowest COVID-19 rates in the country. Um, and then beginning next Tuesday, we're entering stage four of the reopening plan. Uh, we do know that Maine businesses are reopening. They are, they have been reopening all summer. They're actively seeking workers. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, if people are able to work, uh, that they're aware of those opportunities and that we do what we can to help um, support both the workers and the businesses. Next slide. So what are some of the activities? Um, we have included a number of activities that are skill development. Um, we know that you may be trying, that people may be trying to juggle childcare responsibilities um, or um, other uh, challenges that they may be facing. They may be concerned about uh, going back into the particular area of work that they were in before because they may have um, a compromised immune system or they're it, um, or they're just fearful of uh, going back out into the workplace because of their health or someone else's health. Um, so we want to make sure that if you're in any of those situations, that you have alternatives that you can explore, such as strengthening the skills that you have. We all have experienced the need to increase our comfort level with technology. Um, some people are saying the career I had before is something I know I don't want to be returning to. So what is it that we can do to help people connect with appropriate training and resources during this time so that they can strengthen uh, their skills and then re-enter the, uh, the workforce um, in a way that's going to allow them to support themselves and their families. Um, this week, we're not going uh, to dive into very, um, I don't think we've included a slide on the exhaustion of benefits, but for the past several weeks, we have been talking about the fact that anyone who began receiving unemployment benefits in that first week um, of the pandemic, or at least the first week that we were experiencing it uh, in a significant way in Maine in March, has already exhausted their 26 weeks of benefits. Those ran out for folks on um, the week of September 12th. They were, um, if, as long as they were still eligible, those people then moved into uh, pandemic um, emergency unemployment compensation, which is a 13 week program. And the clock is ticking on that. And then the next program as long as unemployment stays high would be the extended benefit program, which also only has um, 13 weeks of benefits in it. So we want to make sure that as long as there are benefits there, um, that people are able to use this time to tap into any of the resources that are available through the career centers so that when they are um, able to go back to work, they have, they're going back with skills that have been upgraded or transitioned um, into a different 
field that people feel more comfortable with. Everything I just said about benefits running out, of course, is predicated on um, Congress not taking additional action. If they do take additional action, we will, you know, revisit that. Next slide. We're also receiving lots of questions about what does work search related activities mean for people who are self-employed? So Kim, I don't know if you want to walk through these. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so we recognize that people who are self-employed have um, different needs than those who are working for another employer. So what we want to do is um, ensure that they are in the preparing process, preparing to open their business. So we'll be asking them if they have either reopened or partially reopened their business, and if not, are they um, performing any of the activities that would help them reopen. This can include, um, as I mentioned, working on your business part-time. You can begin marketing, um, looking at hiring people, attending networking events, uh, or participating in workshops. You can also meet with the uh, Department of Economic and Community Development, their Office of Business Development, to uh, get a better understanding of what resources are out there to help you reopen your business. Um, if an individual was previously self-employed, but they're not planning to reopen their business, then they would be required to do uh, a work search activity uh, related to um, uh, working for another employer. So this could be, you know, as the commissioner just went through the list, contacting employers to see if they're hiring or participating in workshops or um, other networking events related to that. Okay, we, we're updating our FAQs and this information will all be available on the, on the website. Um, but some of the commonly asked questions are, you know, what if my employer is planning to bring me back to work but hasn't done that yet? Um, and Maine law does have a provision in it uh, that permits a work search waiver if your uh, recall date is within six weeks. So uh, for those folks who in the past may have um, been temporarily laid off and had a definite recall date, that provision is still available. Um, so we did want to just make sure that folks knew that this um, elimination of the work search waiver does not in any way impact that six week uh, work search uh, waiver that is available in Maine statute for people who have a definite recall date. Um, and I would just add that that uh, the six week period is uh, only um, available once in any benefit year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Um, we're receiving lots of questions about um, people who have uh, child care responsibilities or maybe are um, providing, uh, acting as a, as a teacher basically at home for their children. Um, and uh, does that change anything? We believe that the options that are available uh, through the activities that we've outlined provide a, uh, enough flexibility that, uh, that one should be able to participate in one of those activities one time a week um, and because they can be done at any time. And um, again, what if you're high risk? I, I, again, it's a, um, an expectation that you would look at the work search related activities. And again, by broadening those activities to participate in online training, um, we believe that the options can be done safely um, from home. Medical quarantine is different. Um, if you have been told by a medical professional that you need to quarantine um, for uh, a particular period of time, the, the work search uh, activities do not apply during that time frame. Um, and uh, if you're working part-time, that counts as uh, work search. You are obviously engaged and connected to the workforce uh, and the weekly certification provides an opportunity for you to uh, indicate that that's what you're doing. We're also getting lots of questions about how many searches do, uh, per week do I have to provide? 
And you're required to participate, as I said a few seconds ago, um, in at least one activity each week. And you need to document that activity on your weekly certification. And we're also asking you to keep a separate um, record of the activities that you've, gained, that you've engaged in, as well as any supporting documentation. For example, a number of the online um, uh, workshops will do a certificate of completion or attendance at the end of them. And we ask you to hold on to those because we are required to audit a certain number of, um, of participants. And uh, if you are, um, if your case is one of those cases that's randomly selected for audit, the more information that you, you provide, uh, the clearer um, the determination will be that you have in fact been in compliance. And then what happens if you don't complete a work search activity? And I believe we've mentioned this before as well. Um, we send a reminder letter to people. Our goal is not to, uh, to kind of ding people for not um, participating in work search. Our goal is to try to help people uh, to, um, to explore options during this time and to make sure that people are aware of the responsibilities. This is not a gotcha. Um, we want to make sure, especially since we know many of the people who are receiving unemployment right now have never received unemployment before. So anyone who um, does not participate in a work search for the first week, uh, they receive a notification from us. It lists all of the opportunities or the kinds of opportunities that could be engaged in in order to satisfy that work search activity. Um, and benefits are not denied for that first week. However, if uh, someone continues to not engage in work search activities, that second time that it happens, um, that person would be scheduled for a fact finding. And if they're determined uh, that, uh, that they should have participated in work search and they did not, a, there would be an overpayment that would be created for that week um, if they had been paid their benefits and that um, those benefits would need to be uh, paid back. So any non-participating in work search activities only applies to the particular week that it took place in. So it's not an automatic ongoing each week when you fill out your weekly certification, you have an opportunity to, um, to identify how you've complied with the work search. Okay, the other question we're starting to get is about unemployment uh, trust funds. I know this has um, generated lots of uh, news um, nationally. There are currently 20 states and one territory um, that are borrowing in order to pay their unemployment insurance benefits. And you may have uh, seen last week, I think it was last week, that the governor uh, set aside $25 million in CRF funds to be included in the UI trust fund in order to minimize um, unemployment insurance um, tax increases for employers and to maintain the solvency uh, of the UI trust fund in our state. As you know, about 45,000 employers in the state um, are, uh, contribute um, to the UI trust fund. They pay taxes on the first $12,000 of wages of their employees. But Kim, did you wanna walk us through this? Sure. So this screen shows that um, as of Wednesday of this week, 20 states and one territory are borrowing money from, this, from the federal government in order to pay their state unemployment benefits. And um, that's a difficult situation to be in. Um, and so I wanted to walk through some of the borrowing requirements that would uh, allow a state to uh, borrow from the federal government. In order to, uh, there's two types of loan. There's an interest-free loan, uh, which is available if a state needs to borrow after January 1st and is in the position to repay that loan by September 30th of the same year. 
a state must be in good standing um, by the federal definition in order to get an interest-free cash flow loan. And in being good standing, it relates to the, um, the balance that was in your trust fund prior to, uh, prior to the pandemic, in essence. It looks at how, that, how the balance in your trust fund compares to um, high benefit years in the past and how much revenue typically comes in on an annual basis. Uh, if a state uh, is not able to meet the requirement of repaying a, a loan by September 30th, then there is interest bearing loans available. As you can see in the upper left corner, right now it's 2.4%. And states have to pay that back by November 10th of the second year after they take out the loan. Um, but timing is everything. And, and really the definition is it has to be repaid by November 10th after the second January 1st. Um, so really timing is everything in that case. So in the examples I have on the screen, uh, a loan taken on December 31st would have to be repaid by November of 2022. A loan taken just three days later on January 2nd, 2021 has an extra year. So, um, and if a state's not able to repay by that November date, then there are repercussions. Employers can lose part of their federal unemployment tax credits and every, every January 1st that goes by, there's additional reductions to that tax credit. Um, also repayment, excuse me, repayment can't be done with the, the typical unemployment taxes that are collected. Those have to go to reshoring uh, up the state trust fund. There would have to be in essence a solvency tax that's added onto that in order to repay the federal loans. Um, and um, in case you're wondering, Maine does qualify as being in good standing with the federal government. So this graph is a uh, snapshot of what the unemployment trust fund balance has looked like for the last two years. As you can see, going back to January of 2019, we were, um, you know, it looks like it's about 470 million. And we stayed pretty consistent uh, right up until the, the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are fluctuations over the course of a year because we um, pay out more benefits during the winter months than we do in other times of the year and um, tax collection collections are higher in April and May. And that's because employers are paying the tax on the first 12,000 in earnings for every employee that they have. Um, so most of that happens earlier in the year uh, as opposed to the, the third and fourth quarters. So as you can see, the graph shows, uh, you know, the March, April, May timeline, there was a substantial drop in the trust fund balance. Uh, this is when COVID-19 hit the hardest uh, and resulted in um, benefit payments that were far greater than we had ever anticipated. The, the spike up is, um, was in June when the governor approved a $269 million transfer from the CARES Act Coronavirus Relief Fund into the trust fund. And as the commissioner mentioned, there was another deposit in September of 25 million. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, employer taxes, employers pay taxes on the first 12,000 in earnings, and this is the majority of funding that goes into the trust fund. Uh, this is not a tax on, on workers, it is the employers. Um, there are on occasion other transfers as with the uh, coronavirus relief funds that get transferred in there. And in the years past, um, back around the, the great recession of 2008, 9, 10, there was additional federal monies that were made available, but typically on an annual basis, the money comes from employer taxes. Those tax rates are calculated by a formula that's set in Maine statute, and it uses the trust fund balance of September 30th of each year. Uh, it compares that balance to um, the total wages for covered employment. That means uh, for employment that is eligible for unemployment benefits. So the total wages statewide in the previous calendar year, and it also compares the balance to the average of the benefits that were paid out in the three highest of the last 20 years. So for Maine, the last, the three highest of those last 20 years are 2008, 9, and 10 during the Great Recession. So based on the results of those comparisons, the tax rates are set um, on, at, to a schedule that is also called out in statute. Schedules range from A to H, with A being the lowest, and for the last four years, Maine has been at Schedule A, which is the lowest tax rate. And I just wanted to add that within each of those schedules, there's also a range of rates. There are 20 different categories that are assigned to an employer based on their experience ratings. 
Um, and I just want to also add that we will have a, an announcement of which schedule we will be on for um, calendar year 2021. We'll announce that by the end of October. And then we will have specific employer tax rates available. So which category they fall in between that um, category one and 20, we'll have those by mid-December. Okay, we also wanted to just um, do a quick update on fraud. This is an issue that we've been talking about for several months now. And I know at the very beginning, um, people were asking questions about how did someone um, come up with the information about my identity, uh, what's happening, and we were saying that um, those stolen identities were from data breaches that occurred across the country. And just recently, um, the Attorney General uh, talked about a, a suit that, um, that Maine had been a party to uh, to settle uh, with Anthem. And this happened in uh, 2015. And about 500,000 Mainers had their PII uh, breached. That information was, um, was released in that, in that data breach. And as you can see, and this is from the press release, um, that uh, the kinds of information that those, um, those criminals had access to were the very kinds of information that one needs in order to file an unemployment insurance claim, which is why uh, those uh, fraud at the beginning of the pandemic was, uh, it was so problematic, not just here, but across the country, with social security numbers, home addresses, email addresses, employment information, and again, there were over 500,000 Mainers um, who had been uh, victimized by that particular attack. Um, we continue to cooperate with the Office of the Inspector General from the US Department of Labor, as well as other enforcement partners. Um, and that investigation is ongoing. Um, Quick reminder to people, Monday is a federal holiday and financial institutions are closed. Um, we do have this information up on our website. Um, so no claims will be, uh, no benefits will be paid out um, on Monday and uh, those benefits will be delayed by one business day. So anyone filing from today through Monday will see a one day delay in their benefits arriving in their account. We also wanted to flag that we have some scheduled maintenance that's coming up um, on Friday, October 16th. Um, we will not, the system will not be accessible from 9 p.m. on Friday through 9 p.m. on Saturday the 17th. Again, that information is on our website. And then on Thursday, October 27th, I mean, 22nd, we have a, um, another um, scheduled maintenance uh, uh, activity that needs to take place. And that'll be from 7.30 on Thursday night until roughly 2.30 a.m. on Friday. And I think with that, we want to um, jump into the questions, if people have questions. Um, I do have one question in the chat box from Representative Cuddy, and employer experience ratings won't be impacted by COVID-related layoffs. Yes, that is correct, Representative. But if others want to ask questions or just please unmute yourself and ask your question. And if there are no questions, that's also fine. <laughs> um, so everyone, uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Please, um, please feel free to contact us, ask us questions. And um, we uh, are updating our website with FAQs um, and um, 
thanks again for spending some time with us on a Friday afternoon. Thank you.